Hello, everybody, and welcome to The Wise Men Presents at the Westport Library. Before I say what's going to happen here, could all the members of The Wise Men please raise your hands? All the non-members. Hey, good, 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 good. Well, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about The Wise Men. It's uh, an organization of mostly retired gentlemen. There are 450 members when we last checked. It's been around for about 40 years, and we exist to help older gentlemen from Westport and Weston live fuller lives. And we get together for hiking, bicycling, bocce, bridge, other things that begin with B, uh, special events, speakers, etc. Tonight, we're in for a uh, special treat. We've got uh, one of Connecticut's most accomplished brewers, Jeff Browning, who is the owner, partner, at Brewport in Bridgeport, Connecticut. Another question, who's been to Brewport? Great, great. Uh, if we do this a year from now, I want to see 100% uh, hands up there. It's a wonderful brew pub at the intersection of Route 8 and Route 95 in Bridgeport, and they serve the best pizza this side of New Haven, some would argue even on the other side of New Haven, and they have eight of their own taps and 16 guest taps, um, and it's the most welcoming uh, casual restaurant you'll ever go to. We're going to taste some beer and learn a little bit about the history of Connecticut beer making. And I'd like uh, everybody to give a warm Westport welcome to Jeff Browning. I was told I need to show you guys what two ounces is. In front of you are five ounce glasses. I have a 16 ounce glass because I've been doing this longer. So if you're gonna be pouring two ounces and we're gonna make sure there's enough beer for everybody, what you wanna make sure is you go to about a third of your glass or you know, two, two and a half fingers, you know, something along those lines. And remember that if there's beer left in the can when it gets passed around, whoever ends up with that wins and you could have a little bit more beer. So I'm going to start by filling my glass. It's a little dry up here. By the way, that's a horrible pour, so please don't tell any of my bartenders that you saw that. We'll let that settle for a second. I'm not really good at standing in one place. So I'm gonna pick up the microphone. We're gonna start, they're gonna go grab the first beer and the first beer is actually our Whaley Lager beer. And uh, I see some distinguished people in the crowd but I doubt anybody is old enough to remember the Whaley Brewing Company that was in West Haven. So uh, what Doug asked me to talk about is a little bit about beer but a lot about history. And you have to start with this beer if we're gonna talk about history. So the Whaley Brewing Company was right across the street from Notre Dame High School. Did anybody happen to go to Notre Dame West Haven? Up in my direction, lots of people went to Notre Dame West Haven. That actually used to be an orphanage and it became Notre Dame High School in the 30s, I believe. But the Whaley Brewing Company was right across the street. The Whaley family also owned Genesee. I'm pretty sure most of you have probably had Genesee beer at one point or another. And right after Prohibition, they decided to open up the old Weibel Brewery and they started, the family name is Whaley, spelt kind of oddly. Uh, but they opened the brewery in 1933 and they stayed in business until 1944. And the reason that they went out of business in 1944 is they were very smart brewers and they knew that uh, during World War II that there was a grain ration and a tin ration and owning two breweries was tough to get anybody to have enough beer. So they made a deal with the federal government that they would shut down the facility in West Haven as long as they got the grain and the tin rations for Genesee and Rochester. And that's really the biggest reason that Genesee as a brand still exists. So the Whaley Lager beer is a very simple beer, and it's how every lager beer was brewed back then. 
Now, you watch the commercials, and Budweiser will tell you they're the oldest lager beer in America. That's a, fa a fallacy. Yingling is the oldest brewery and the oldest lager brewery in America. But Bud Budweiser will also tell you that they've never changed their recipe. That's an impossibility. They changed their recipe probably hundreds, if not a thousand times. In 1942, Whaley Lager beer was 5.4% alcohol, 45 IBUs. Now, an IBU is the bittering units, and it, the higher the number, obviously, the more bitter a beer. So in 1942, Whaley was 5.2% alcohol, 45 IBUs. So was Budweiser and every other national brand you could think of. They were all trying to do the same thing. This particular recipe I acquired from a mass of information that was found in the cellar in a house in Stratford. So this particular recipe is from November 6th, 1942. So you don't get any more exacting than that. So when you guys are pouring the Whaley Lager beer, what I want you guys to, to think about is this was the beer that most of the people in Connecticut was drinking right before they jumped on the boat and went across the sea to fight the Germans and then eventually uh, fight the Japanese. So this was considered pretty much the standard lager of the time. It's going to be a little fuller, a little darker in color, and a little bit more bitter than most of the American national brands. Uh, currently, Budweiser is 5% alcohol. But uh, I turned 18 in 1981. So the drinking age was still 18 and 81, and I was allowed to legally drink in 1981. In 1981, Budweiser was 4.2% alcohol and 16 IBUs. Bush was 4.2% alcohol and 14 IBUs. Basically the same beer. And if anybody remembers in college or people said you can't tell the difference between Bud and Bush if it's on draft, they were 100% right. Bud would scream and yell and say, well, we use rice and it's more expensive, and Bush, which they owned, used corn. All those things are, are uh, sugar substitutes that create alcohol and give off no flavor. So it was exactly the same beer. Budweiser started losing the alcohol wars to craft beer in the 80s and slowly started bringing their alcohol level up to what American ales were, which is roughly 5%. So that's where this beer has stayed the entire time. Now, it went out of business in 1942, and I brought it back, but that's really what people were drinking back in those days. So what I'd like everybody to do is to just take a sip and just think back to maybe what was going on in 1942. Uh, I'm assuming maybe one or two of you were alive back then, but probably not most of you. And uh, it's just a really good, easy-drinking lager beer. So let's start with cheers. And I'm going to take a sip of my beer. The head's died down. So my goal up here tonight is to hopefully entertain you guys for a bit, give you some history of Connecticut brewing and brewing in general, and also give you an opportunity to try five of our products. We're going to try to do a product once about every 10 minutes. I was asked to talk for about 50 minutes. And uh, so that kind of breaks down pretty simply. So keep that in your mind as you're drinking what you're drinking. And if anybody needs to run to the men's room or whatever, you know, please feel free. You're not going to insult me if you get up. Also, I was told that if anybody wants to ask me questions, we have a microphone over there that is hot with a camera on it. Uh, I don't have any problem with people asking me questions, but we are going to do a Q&A at the end. Uh, hopefully, I will uh, inspire a little bit of thought, and some of you guys will want to uh, ask me a couple of things. So the history of brewing, that's uh, really what was, uh, I was asked to talk about. So uh, I hope you guys got your depends on because we could be here for literally days. <laughs> brewing started in Samaria. Everybody is aware of the fact that we stopped being nomadic to start growing grain. It is widely thought that we stopped being nomadic to grow grain specifically to make beer. Um, I'm not going to argue that point. The oldest deity in the world is Ninkasi, the Sumerian goddess of beer. I had a Weimariner 20 years ago, and my 12-year-old daughter named her Ninkasi. So my kids were very well educated in the barley malt spirits even back then. Uh, but if you think about it, that's, what, 6,000 years ago. The process of making beer has changed zero. It has literally changed zero. There's four ingredients. It's pretty easy. You guys could probably state them with me. Water, malt, hops, and yeast. Malt is grain. It's the malted version. Uh, 
We didn't know yeast existed until Carlsberg, Carlsbergian yeast was discovered in 1540 something, if I can go back that far in my head. Uh, what everybody thought was is they were praying to whatever their local god was, Ninkasi or Dionysus or whatever other god there was. But fermentation happened spontaneously. And what's interesting is this is a pretty large room. There are probably trillions of microbes in this room, and a huge number of them is yeast. The interesting thing about that is there's really only about two dozen yeast strains that actually make good beer. The rest of them, not so much. But the fact that we were intuitive enough and experimental enough, or just downright belligerent enough to keep trying, we figured out. One type of yeast makes great bread. Another type of yeast makes great beer. A different type of yeast makes champagne or wine or whatever. And this is thousands of years of refining four ingredients. Pretty cool. There's been an explosion of breweries in the last really 30 years. But in, the, in Connecticut, it's really the last 10 years that things have just blown up. Pre-prohibition... There were thousands of breweries, and every town had their own brewery. There were 28 breweries in New Haven alone pre-prohibition. It was called the Milwaukee of the East Coast. There's a great underground river that has great water. It's where the Hulls Brewery was uh, uh, drafted all of their water from. It's where Whaley drafted their water from. There was Weibel Brewery, uh, the Braun Brewery, Staley Brewing Company. I don't need to name them all because you guys won't know them anyways. But the point I'm making is that we were very locally oriented. And then, you know, the big bad monster, Anheuser-Busch, decided literally almost immediately, turn of the century, turn of, of the 20th century, that he wanted to be a world power and a global product, which hadn't happened yet. Budweiser was a premium product, one of the very first bottled beers. And it was bottled starting in the 80s, and it was bottled sparkling. There was still beer and sparkling beer. Most beer was still because the bottles would explode or the caps would come out and you'd waste the product, so they didn't add carbonation. Budweiser was pretty smart in thinking, yeah, let's do this. Or I should say the Anheuser, uh, the, the Anheuser and Bush families, those are two separate families, really decided they were going to do something. They weren't very big. They started in St. Louis, but they started to push out their local market. And they decided, which is brilliant, which is, it was the first global marketing, if I need to get from St. Louis to Chicago, maybe I should own rail cars. And then they're like, well, if I'm going to own rail cars, maybe I should own the railroad. And then they're like, okay, well, if I'm going to own the rail cars and the railroad, maybe I should own the grain fields. And they slowly and methodically bought everything that they needed. And what happened during Prohibition, the, the grand experiment, as people like to say, it was uh, it introduced us to organized crime and flapper girls. Those are both wonderful things. Uh, but during the period of time of Prohibition, Anheuser-Busch had already set up a network that allowed them to become a, a, a regional giant in ice delivery in growing grain, making malt for other things like candy, malted milk balls, the same stuff that we make with beer. The center of those little wonderful whoppers is exactly the same thing that we make before we add hops to it and boil it down and ferment it. So they had all of this infrastructure that allowed them to keep growing. And then the breweries, like the Genesee Brewing Company that I mentioned, and Yingling, and we can go down the list of, of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds that closed and never reopened during Prohibition, uh, and then the ones that tried to open after Prohibition and just didn't have their shit together because they didn't have all of this other infrastructure. Anheuser-Busch wasn't the number one selling beer even in St. Louis, turn of the century. It was not the number one selling beer in the United States until 1968. Anybody want to take a guess on what the number one the number one selling beer in the United States was in the 60s? Very near and dear to us. Good guess, Schaefer and Miller. It was Ballantine. Ballantine, right from Brooklyn, number one selling beer. But they also had the same problem: is that, that they had grand facilities, but they didn't update their facilities. So during this period of time of jumping and growing, 
all these breweries just were happy to get up and running. Now, the thing that I've learned, I've done some research, and Dr. Terry Foster, the beer author, and myself have a book coming out. Uh, I'm not sure when it, it, we have an, a publisher. I'm not sure when it'll be printed sometime, hopefully in the next 12 months. And it is The Life and Death of a Brewery. It is based on the history of two brewing families based in New Haven and in Bridgeport. And I mentioned before about the Whaley beer and where that recipe came from. It came out of a just a massive amounts of handwritten documents from two brewers from Bridgeport and from New Haven. And it, it showed up at the Two Roads Brewing Company. And it's a great little story because my best friend and now the head of the beer department for Brescom Barton, which is the largest distributor in the state of Connecticut, Dan Zeke, happened to be his very first day at Two Roads. Dan was one of my athletes when I was a, a swim coach. And this gentleman walked in and said, I have all of this paperwork. Most of it rolled into scrolls, like the Dead Sea Scrolls. And it's my great-grandfather's brewing information. Do you think anybody here would want it? Well, the first person that they talked to kind of just blew them off. The second person in the hallway was Dan Zeke. Now, if you want to believe in fate or karma or kismic or whatever you want to call it, Dan said, probably nobody in this building, but I know the guy. And he gave him my phone number. I called him. And I was at his house in about two and a half hours. Now, I didn't own Brewport at the time. I was a brewer in New Haven. Brewers don't make a lot of money. I come very, from very simple means. And I said, I want, I want to come and look at this stuff. He had four plastic bins. Most of it, handwritten documents rolled into to balls with old, old twine on it. And I'm looking at it, and I'm like, this stuff is priceless. Why don't you grab the next beer? We'll go to that one. This stuff is priceless, and I want it. I've been, I've been a collector since I was, I was 10 years old. I started brewing beer when I was 12 years old. Thank God to Jimmy Carter for making brewing legal, and thank God to Caldors for selling Cooper beer kits to 12-year-olds because the ingredients weren't illegal. And I literally started brewing beer in my closet when I was 12 years old. My parents... Uh, my, my father always had a problem with me saying this, but I'm going to repeat it anyways. Uh, I kind of grew up Southern Baptist. We were from upstate New York. My parents were Baptist. And, you know, the only reason I say Southern Baptist is you, you understand what that means. It means that there's no drinking in the house and we were strict and, you know, two hours at church every Sunday. And just, you know, so I told my father that I was doing science experiments in my closet. <laughs> Smelt like baked bread. I was doing science experiments. It was probably somewhere about the time I was 15 or 16 when my father got a little annoyed at all my science experiments in the closet. And he said to me, he's like, if that's a science experiment, make me a root beer. So I developed Wellington's Old Style Root Beer when I was 16 years old. This is a non-alcoholic root beer that is malt-based, not cane sugar-based. And my father was a soda jerk at a local uh, apothecary in upstate New York and used to tell me stories about making malted milkshakes. So I made him a malted root beer. And that's all I needed to do, as long as Wellington's was available. And very quickly, Wellington's is a family name. It was my great-grandfather, grandfather, father, brother, and nephew's middle name. So I was a little suck-up even at 16 because I still wanted to brew beer in my closet. Uh, I got a little off point talking about the... Uh, this paperwork. So I get to this paperwork and I get to the guy's house and this stuff is priceless. He has a, the, literally the brewing manuals from the 1880s. He has this guy's test and results from going to the American Brewing Academy in New York City before there was a Brooklyn and a Manhattan and a, and a Queens. It just said New York City. And all of the experiments that the guy had done and all of the batch sheets and every day of everything he'd ever done, starting in, in about 1888 all the way to 1943. And the Whaley Lager beer was one of the last things this gentleman did before he retired. What he did was he was doing the inventories and controlling the, the, the products, and he was meticulous. So I opened up one of these books, and I see all of these numbers, and I could tell that it's inventory, and it says grain and hops and, and brewing salts and technical words that I know that, that I don't need to throw around. But next to them were abbreviations, and there was B-U-K and P-A-L, 
CAB, and I forget one other one. And it just hit me because I'm a collector and I have been a history fan since I was a child that what those abbreviations stood for was Buckingham Ale, Whaley Pale Ale, Cab Cream Ale, Whaley Lager Beer, the beer that we just drank. So by looking at those depletions and knowing the size of the brewery, I was able to recreate the recipes. And that was one of the first beers that I recreated um, from that information, and it's been a huge hit, and we sell it at Brewport all the time. It is seasonal. It takes about five or six weeks to brew a lager, or it takes anywhere between 14 to 30 days to brew an ale. So it's not always at Brewport. The next beer that you guys have in your hand is the uh, Blood Orange Blonde. The Blood Orange Br Blonde has a brand new look. We gave our little lady a new dress, very psychedelic. So what you'll find, at least for me, is that beer is the most social thing on the planet. Benjamin Franklin said that the president and a pig farmer can go to a bar and have one thing in common, the ale in front of them. And I completely agree with that and believe in that. I have been, you know, I have not well-traveled, but I've traveled a lot. And when you sit down at a bar, and you ask the bartender a question about the local products, be it scotch in Scotland, you know, Guinness in Ireland, or Murphy's in Southern Ireland, or you travel around the United States and you ask them what's the, what's the best local beer, you immediately have a friend. And that is one of the most wonderful things about being in the beer business. And I am not lying to you when I tell you I started brewing beer when I was 12. I started running beer tastings when I was 18. I started running beer dinners in my 20s. I became a commercial brewer just before I turned 30, and I've never looked back, and I've, I love it. The Blood Orange Blonde that you just opened is our number one selling beer at Brewport. It outsells every beer on tap, no matter what it is, four to one, every day, all day, 365 days a year. It is an approachable beer for people who aren't big beer drinkers, but it's got enough quality and distinction for the beer geeks. The way this beer came about was, as I've stated several times, I've been brewing a long time, I had brewed at bar, and the number one selling beer at bar was Toasted Blonde. It was a recipe of mine, and at the time, it was the number one selling draft beer in the state of Connecticut, and it was only served at bar in New Haven. That's a pretty big feat. We we're selling 480 barrels a year of that one product, and no other brewery was big enough yet to outsell that. So when I started the brewery at uh, Bridgeport, Brewport, I decided I have to start with a beer that I know because equipment is all different. Temperatures isn't, is, isn't different, but temperature gauges are different. So when you brew beer, two degrees changes everything. Two degrees. So when you're mashing in, which is taking the grain, mixing it with hot water and letting it steep like in a coffee maker and converting those starches to sugar, if that mash temperature is designed for 50 degrees and you hit 53 degrees, you're going to get a sweeter beer. If you're looking for a beer like the Stouts or the Old News, a few of the ones I have up here, that we want to mash in at 54, 55 degrees and you miss on the bottom end, you're going to get a thinner beer. You're not going to get as much complex carbohydrates, therefore you're not going to get enough of that flavor. A lager beer, always 40, 148 to 150 degrees. Same thing with fermentation. Ales are fermented at basically room temperature. We ferment most of our beers at 68 degrees. But if you ferment a beer at 71 degrees, it's going to be very fruity. If you ferment that same beer at 57 or 56 degrees, it'll be cleaner or void all of those esters. So really important. So what I decided I needed to do with a new brewing system is brew the most known product I have, which was the Toasted Blonde, and I ran that recipe through the system. Everything worked fine. The finished product was very thin, light. Now, just from what I told you, you could probably surmise that my gauges were off, and what I thought was 150, 151 was actually more like 148. So I ended up with a lot more fermentables, so the yeast ate all of those sugars and left me with no flavor behind. So I have 700 gallons, and you know, brewers are quite frugal. We, we made a lot of money through, uh, through the Prohibition era. You don't throw anything away. So I have 700 gallons of a product that uh, really isn't ready for prime time, but I'm not going to throw it away. Putting juice in beer was just starting to become a big thing. 
So I'm like, you know what? I am, I am an English ale brewer. I am a classic brewer. I'm a historical brewer. I am not a newfangled fancy brewer. You're not going to find me putting Fruit Loops in my beer or Cocoa Puffs or, or donuts or any of the other stupid things that you find from Evil Twin or 12%. But putting the right amount of blood orange juice in this product elevated the flavor just enough to make it worthwhile. Originally, my blonde ale in Bridgeport was supposed to be called the Bridgeport Blonde. In hindsight, that sounds a little bit like a Puerto Rican hooker on a corner, so I'm really glad that uh, we didn't do that. So I put the blood orange juice in this beer. There's literally one gallon per barrel. A barrel is 31 and a half gallons, so it's 1 31th, that's really not the right way to say that, uh, juice, but it's just enough to give you a little bit of flavor. The first three days we were open, we sold 1,385 pints. I looked at my partners and I said, I'm going to be bringing this beer for the rest of my life. What I did do is I adjusted the recipe to carry the juice. I brought the temperatures to where they needed to be. And I added the body and the backbone to the beer to give you a good quality ale. It's really an English ordinary bitter with a little bit of blood orange uh, juice added to it. Now my son, who is our brewmaster, and he's had lots of experience. He's the only 33-year-old with 33 years of experience. Uh, he is the one who brews this beer, and he truly understands the reverence of not screwing it up. Because the most important thing when it comes to beer is that it tastes the same the next time you have it. Because we've all had, my favorite thing is, is I'll go back to Budweiser. My favorite thing is when I do a talk like this, somebody said, you know, I used to drink Budweiser all the time. It's not the same anymore. And I'm like, you're 100% right. Then you got the guy next to him who says, I drink Budweiser every day. They haven't changed the thing. You're not going to notice the change because what they do is they take a third of every batch and they blend it into the last batch or the next batch and the next batch. It takes almost two years for the final ounce of that first batch to be totally washed out of the, the batch two years from them. So when they raise the alcohol content, they don't do it in a batch. They do it over a period of a year or two when they change the hops. They don't do that from today till tomorrow. They do that over a period of time. So if you're constantly drinking the same beer, you're not going to notice. But if you sporadically drink that beer and you've noticed a difference, you're 100% right. Absolutely. I mean, think about that with, with, with food. I mean, I'm sure that the cooking that your wife or husband does probably has varied over the many years. You don't notice the difference. But if you only come to the house once a year, you'll notice the difference. So how is that blood orange blonde out there? Are we liking that? I gotta check my watch here because I have a tendency to run on. I think we're doing okay. Uh, our third beer is called the Roadie. And are we ready to uh, break out the third beer? Has everybody had what they needed to with those other two beers? So uh, again, I'm gonna get back to the history. I talked about the Sumerians. Let's talk about just the history in the United States. Uh, one of the most amazing thing about beer is that people don't realize that beer has changed everything. We stopped being nomadic to grow grain, to brew beer, so we could get a buzz on and make the, the life's worries of the daily work week go away for a little while, or to meet your God or whatever else that people were doing with alcoholic beverages back then. What's interesting is the oldest known sign in the world is a pub sign from Egypt advertising beer. We have now learned that the Egyptians didn't build pyramids with slave labor. They built pyramid with, with the, the, the base of every economy, with the working class, and they housed them, and they fed them, and they gave them beer. The other interesting thing about uh, ancient Egypt is they have signs that say, drunkenness is punishable by death. There'd be a whole lot less people in Connecticut if that was true here. Their standard of drunkenness and our current standard of drunkenness are completely different. So as far back as the ancient Egypts, this was very important. I'm going to jump ahead a ton of years. We're going to jump to, to the, the, the age of Jesus Christ. Now, as I said, my parents were very religious, and I was brought up a Christian. And I always had a problem with one thing. Jesus turned the water to wine? Common people didn't drink wine. Show me a grape in Israel, in any of that area. If anything, they're, you know, crushing uh, olives. If Jesus turned anything 
into anything. He turned it into the common man's drink. He turned water into beer because he was the common man's person. So I have frequently had theologic or theologic discussions with especially my Catholic friends. And I always ask them the same thing. If the, if the Christian religion started in Bethlehem, why is the head of the religion in Italy? If the head of the Christian religion is in Italy, it makes sense that when the books were rewritten, they were rewritten to reflect the things that the people around them knew. I think the Bible is a great uh, book of stories, a great moral book, and, and a lot of parables. I do not argue that it's fact or fiction, but I do believe that it has been written and rewritten and rewritten and rewritten and rewritten to fit the needs of the rich people to help keep the poor people in line. And Jesus turned water to wine because somebody in the you know, 10th century decided it sounded better because they were all, you know, sipping wine while they were rewriting the Bible. We could argue that afterwards if anybody disagrees with me. I'm going to jump ahead a little further. So now we have the Black Plague. Almost ended humanity. Does anybody know what saved humanity from the Black Plague? I'll give you one guess. Beer! When Doug was talking about all the bees that the uh, wise men do, he should have said, drink beer. You miss that bee. So the first wave of the Black Plague killed a ton of people. The second wave of the Black Plague, the rich folk had already learned that beer is boiled, the water is boiled, that beer or the alcoholic beverage part of beer protects the water morning, noon, and night, and they didn't die. The poor bastards that didn't, couldn't afford their own you know, tankards of ale, not so lucky. So it became very clear that you know, it's, it's the early form of sterilization that by boiling the water, it's gonna be you know, healthier for you. The, the, the fun fact about beer during this period of time, and it lasted, Jesus, probably uh, shouldn't say that, uh, 400 years, is there was something called table beer. And if, if you're old enough, you might remember a little bit of the, their table beer. The New England Brewing Company that used to exist, not the one from Norwalk and now in, in uh, Woodbridge, but the original New England Brewing Company that was based in Hartford, had table beer. And it was 3.2% alcohol. It was deliberately low alcohol, and that was, the, that was the liquid on the table that you drank morning, noon, and night. It was considered not alcoholic. When the great experiment of prohibition started, the fine men of Connecticut, specifically Connecticut, fought very hard to not ratify the uh, 18th Amendment. Uh, and they argued quite lengthy at, uh, in Congress that beer wasn't alcoholic that wine and hard liquor was the problem, but beer wasn't alcoholic. And I think it was somebody like uh, Howard Taft's size that said that I dare the individual to serve me enough beer to prove that it makes me drunk. Well, if you're 400 pounds, I kind of can understand that. And again, there wasn't a whole lot of driving going on back then. So the idea of drinking beer, children, adults, and old people, is really something that goes way, way back, and it protected us and it saved us from you know, the second wave of the Black Plague. I'll jump a little further forward. So we have Louis Pasteur. Everybody knows what Pasteur did, right? What did Pasteur do? He made milk safe. No, he didn't give a shit about milk. He didn't like the fact that his English ales would spoil quickly. So he knew that the, the stuff in it didn't kill them. Same bacteria as the spoiled beer makes cheese and makes sour ales and other things, so it didn't hurt you. But it didn't make his beer taste good. He wanted his beer to stay the same. So he developed pasteurization, bringing up a product up to 180 degrees, bringing it back down to room temperature, got rid of any of the microbes, killed the yeast, as well as the lactobacillus and all those other interesting bacteria that make wonderful cheeses and makes your beer smell like feet. So Pasteur was trying to make his beer taste better. I'm going to jump forward a little bit more. We're going to go to the very first uh, paved road in the United States. I think you guys already know the answer to this, but why did they pave the first road in the United States? 
so they can move beer from one town to the other town during the rainy season. Infrastructure, beer. Pasteurization, beer. Us being alive today, beer. Beer's done some pretty good things. With that said, I will tell you now a sentence that I say at every single lecture, at every single dinner, at every single event that I ever talk at. I love beer. But everyone should drink intelligently and make sure that they drive safely. So cheers to that. So the beer you just opened is called the Roadie. If you've been to Brewport since we opened, we used to have a beer called Seventh Inning Sippa, Seventh Inning Session IPA. I developed that beer because I like beer. I also love baseball, and we all know that you want to go to a baseball game and in the seventh, especially nowadays, didn't used to be, it's at the, the half inning of the seventh inning, all baseball parks stop selling beer. Now, if you were me and my friends at Yankee Stadium, we probably should have start, stopped in the fifth inning, but we are still drinking beer until the seventh and seventh and a half inning. But what is now called the roadie used to be called the seventh inning session IPA. A session IPA is a lower alcohol version of an IPA. It should have the same quality, body, and characteristics of a standard IPA, little less alcohol. So this is the beer that I brewed to make sure that you don't go home with ugly people. So if you're looking to have a couple of beers and want to keep your head about yourself, you should drink a session ale. Our session ale is now called roadie because next door to us used to be the bluefish. And I thought it was a great idea to have a beer that tied to the baseball and seventh inning session IPA made sense. This year, we rebranded the exact same recipe and we called it the roadie. And if you read the write-up about the roadie, it is very clear. The roadie is the first guy to get there and the last guy to leave, but he wants to have a great ale just like you and me. At 4.6% alcohol, you have a beer that you can consume in moderation and still get the job done. So this is the beer that you should drink or any session IPA, if you just wanna have a beer, but you know that you have a long drive and you don't wanna fall asleep. And you know, my thing is I don't really wanna run into a busload of nuns because I figured that that would, I'm already doomed from all the other stuff I said. So we at, at, at uh, Brewport, if you look at the menu that I put out there, every single beer we sell, you have the alcohol content listed. You also can buy seven, 12, and 16 ounce glasses of every single beer, unless it's 8% alcohol or higher. Then we will only sell you a seven or a 12 ounce glass. That's because I'm a capitalist and I wanna make sure that when you come to Brewport and have fun that you get home safely so you can come back. Because you know, if, you, if you're just letting people drink willy nilly, there's a handful of them that are probably not coming back and I don't want that to happen. I have been doing this for a long time and my parents are in my ear. My mom's voice is with me every day, and I want people to enjoy what I love, but I want them to be able to judge and decide for themselves. I am 165 pounds. 20 years ago, I was 275 pounds. 270 pound Jeff can drink a lot of beer. 165 pound Jeff, eh, not so much. My son is 6'2 and about 280. I go to the bar with him. I don't want to, you know, I don't want to look like a wuss. I'm not, you know, I want to go beer for beer. He can drink the 16 ounce beers. I drink the 12 ounce beers. He wants to have one more beer. I have a seven ounce beer. I still got a beer in my hand. I still get to play the frat boy game, but I'm being responsible. I have taught this since I began speaking about beer, way before it was popular because I'll go back to the fact that I'm a capitalist. I want people to buy more of my beer. I want you to buy it because you like it. I want you to buy it because it's got a great story. I want you to buy it because it's, it's good for you. It's not a bad product. I don't want anybody to abuse it. I can't stop you from over drinking, but I can give you all the tools not to. So that's why we have a session, a session beer here. We are, uh, am I doing good on time? I don't want to uh, take up too much time. We have two more products to go. Uh, I'm kind of curious, the Session IPA, like it, don't like it, put your hands up if you like it. Terrific. And by the way, if there's a product here that isn't for you, I teach my staff all the time. We have almost 80 employees at Brewport now. One of the greatest accomplishments of my life isn't this collection of beers. It's not 
that my son works with me, although that's right up there on the top. My greatest accomplishment is that I have been able to employ almost 80 people in Bridgeport, give them a living wage, help them move from young adults into the real world through working in our kitchen, working as a server, and just any of the jobs. We have parking lot staff. I mean, we do. Brewport has more non-revenue um, uh, building employees than any other restaurant you'll ever go to. We have two to three people in our parking lot almost every night. We have anywhere between two to five hosts. So if you think about it, that could be as many as eight employees. Not one of them is selling you a product. That is deliberate. That is because I want you to have the best experience, and I'm not greedy. You know, my, my vacations when I was a kid was putting a tent in the backyard. That was, you know, my father would bring the TV out there if the Yankees were on, and we'd go camping. We went from the house in Milford a whole mile away to Woodmont Beach for the day, for the week that he had off. That was how I grew up, and I loved it. The only thing I wanted beer and Brewport to do for me is to give me better vacations. I don't need bigger houses, I don't need more cars, I don't need any of that. But it is such a great gift to be able to educate the people that have come to work for me. We are seven and a half years old, I still have 15 original employees. If anybody's ever been in the restaurant business, if you have one original employee after six months, that's doing pretty good. So not only do we make sure we take care of our people and pay them well, my, my employees all get vacation, even if you're part-time. Work for me for a year, we will give you a week's vacation pay. I mean, it might only be 200 bucks, but we're gonna give it to you. My partners are Bruce and John Barrett. They're the billboard guys. If you drive up and down on 95, you'll see the red banner with the white letters that say Barrett. I have known them since the second grade. Their mother was my den mother in Cub Scouts, and my father was their Weeblos leader when we got a little bit older. They took over their father's billboard business, and they own our building. Bruce came to me, who was my age, and said, I got this building in Bridgeport. You know, I've been wanting to see if somebody wanted to make a restaurant out of it. Haven't gotten any bites. Maybe we can do it. And I took a look at this big empty space, and I'm like, we'll do it. I had no idea what we were gonna do, but I figured it out. I'm a bit of a dreamer, and I have been able to make those dreams come to fruition pretty simply. We're gonna go to the next beer, and the next beer is really a, uh, it's a straight up West Coast IPA. I'll explain to what that means in just a minute. But the, uh, this beer is 100% my son's. It is his recipe. He was the man behind it. He put it all together. Uh, my partner, John Barrett, has uh, two sons, and uh, they're both on the spectrum, and Patrick does our labeling. So if you happen to notice, most of our labels are perfect because that's a great thing to give somebody who's on the spectrum. He doesn't like it if it's, if it's off a little bit. So Patrick was here at the brewery one day, and my son had put this beer together. He didn't have a name for it. I do all the write-ups. I usually name all the beers. I said, Jeff, it's your beer. You name it. So he's talking to my marketing girl, and Patrick comes out from the canning line, and Jeff looks at Patrick, and he goes, Patrick, we've got this beer. What should we name it? And he looked at him, and he goes, high tide, and he walked away. And I heard him say it, and I'm like, it's perfect. Patrick didn't know what he was saying, but we grew up by the water. Bruce and John Barrett literally grew up in Point Beach on the water. Now, back in our day, waterfront property is where poor people lived. It was all rental property. Now it's completely changed. But they lived right in the floodplain in Point Beach, right on the water. And at high tide, you could jump off their wall, never touch bottom, and just go swim. It was like one of the most wonderful things. If you've ever been to any of the beaches in Milford, most of them are rocky. And at low tide, you're cutting your feet on barnacles and you're slipping and sliding, trying to get, you know, you got to walk out 100 yards before you can get, you know, nipple deep in the water. So high tide was a wonderful time. So when Patrick said that, I sat down and I wrote the write-up for the high tide, which you guys can read. But this beer my son nailed. It is an amazing mixture of new age hops and old world brewing, and I just think it's terrific. I'm gonna take another sip of beer now. I don't know if you guys noticed, but I opened the roadie because I practice what I preach. I literally could talk for hours about the history of brewing, 
But what I really want to do, we only have, I don't know, 20 minutes or so left, is talk just a bit about brewing in Connecticut. So we all know this massive explosion of craft brewing. It came about for a couple of different reasons. If you think about it, you know, everybody in this room probably knows a great bakery that has the best artisanal bread. Just amazing bread. Where was that bakery in 1981? Was there any? Not in my neighborhood. If there was a bakery, they weren't making bread. They might be making, you know, cakes and pies, but they weren't making bread. What happened to the bread industry is the same thing that happened to the beer industry. Anheuser-Busch and breweries like Miller and Coors, they decided that if they can't beat them, they'll buy them. So as Anheuser-Busch grew, they started taking literally systematically over markets. And they did it in the most unscrupular way, unscrupulous way. They undercut the local brewery. They came into Connecticut, 1968. Hulls was the number one selling beer in Connecticut. Ballantyne was the number one selling beer in the United States. And ales in Connecticut still outsold lagers because there's a lot of English people in Connecticut. And ales were still a, strong, a stronghold, even though lagers had exploded starting in about 1890, but really um, World War II and on. But ales were still a huge thing in Connecticut. So Budweiser came in, and they say, okay, you have hulls on tap? We're going to give you all new glassware. We're going to give you a whole new draft system, but you got to have Budweiser on tap. And people say, well, we don't want to have Budweiser on tap. And he goes, all right, then you're not going to get anything. And the bar next door got brand new glassware, got beautiful signs, got all the wonderful bells and whistles, and they put Budweiser on tap. Then they went to the next bar, and they said, we want to put, you know, we want to build you a new bar. We want to give you new equipment, but you got to put our beer on tap. And the guy said, well, I don't want to do that. And he goes, well, if you don't do that, we're not going to come back and offer you this again. And keep in mind, that infrastructure was falling apart. Nobody did much. In, in World War II, the only way breweries stayed open was by having literally a trade system for parts. So if a little brewery closed in your town, they literally ran into that, like the old west, and grabbed the boots and whatever else they could find and made sure that their pumps kept running and that they had the right amount of copper and all the things that they needed. So in 1968, if you were still around and holding, you know, at least holding on, you weren't spending money on the bars that were putting your beer on tap. In 1935, when uh, Prohibition was repealed, the Cremo Brewing Company in New Britain, Connecticut, dominated their region and every bar sold Cremo. New Britain had a ton of factories. Every bar sold Cremo. There was a guy that would sit on one of these tables just like this with a chair and a ledger, and I have pictures of it, and the factory would give you 20 minutes for lunch. Everybody would rush out of the factory across the street to the bar that sold Cremo. They had 100 shots and hundreds of beers poured, and that guy, that little accountant dude, would sit there checking off your name. You had three, you had four, you probably had more than four, and they just kept checking stuff off. At the end of the month when they got their check, they walked across the street, and that bar owner cashed their check, paid your bar tab, and the rest of the money went home to the wives. Most of the men were working then, I'm not trying to be sexist. And that's why the women got pissed off at the guys all the time because they were drinking away most of the paycheck across the street. Well, that went on. Budweiser came in and said, okay, so we're going to give away more. We're going to give you beer. If you, don't, if you won't put hulls on, we'll give you the beer for a little while. And they systematic and slowly put every little brewery out of business. Hulls went out of business in 1978. Uh, they stopped brewing beer in 1976 and still had enough beer in their lagering tanks that when they had a mysterious fire, uh, there were still just thousands of barrels of product. I know this firsthand because I was 12, 13, 13 during that period of time, roughly, maybe a little older. Um, and I jumped on a bus with my buddy, Buzzy, and we went to the Hulls Brewery because I was a collector. Beer can collecting was huge in the 70s. I still have my beer can collection. Uh, we went to the Hulls Brewery, and we climbed over giant piles of labels and bottle caps and full cases of beer to grab the signs and to grab all the cool shit. And that was a direct result 
to Anheuser-Busch systematically putting people out of business. And big business has been doing that, like they put Wonder Bread, put artisanal bread out of business. But something wonderful happened in the 80s. We got down to 17 breweries in the United States, 17. Now there was more facilities in 17, but Budweiser owned 27 of them, and Miller owned 14 of them, and Pabst owned another you know, 19. They were all making the same stuff. I can vividly remember when the 30 packs came out, those longer cases of beer were like, six more beers? Yes. And grabbing those 30 packs and bringing it to the beach, and as the cans rolled out, that red, white, and blue, one after the other, that $7 30 pack that was disgusting, all of a sudden, a Schmitz rolled out afterwards. What's a Schmitz doing in a red, white, and blue 30 pack? Same beer. All they did was stop the line and change the cans. The best brewery to do this was the, um, the Iron City Brewing Company in Pittsburgh. Iron City had one beer and over 100 labels. My favorite story is the old timers that would tell me about the literal fights in the street, that there would be the Fort Schuyler bar on this side of the street and the Iron City bar on this side of the street, and they would absolutely go after each other that my beer's better than your beer. It was the same damn beer. <laughs> Marketing is an amazing thing. We've got brand new words like crun, crun, crunchiest. You know, I mean, you think about, you know, we think cheese it you know, is a noun, you know, I mean, there's like, it's amazing what we were sold. But in the 80s, a couple of people on the West Coast said, I'm done, I'm tired. Beer all tastes the same and it's not any good. I didn't like beer when I was young. I brewed it, didn't like it. Didn't like national brand lagers, blats. It sounded the same way coming in as it did going out, blats. It's just horrible, $1.99 a six pack and I got a six pack after every swim meet because that's what we did back then but I hated it. I used to go to the keg parties and I'd have, I had a 20 ounce pitcher because pitcher, I was cool. And I'd fill it up at the keg and I'd walk around and make sure the girls saw me with my big pitcher. And then I'd take a couple of sips and it would get warm. And then I'd go in the bushes and throw it out and go back to the keg because that's the cool spot. Fill it up again. They all thought I was neat. Meantime, I was brewing all these English ales and learning about my craft. In the early 80s, ales came back. Craft everything came back, artisanal breads. If you think about it, all this little stuff, we got tired of having the same crappy pants. We got tired of all these things. All came back in the 80s. What's happening right now is that we are so saturated with breweries and products that we don't have good products. There are, in Connecticut, 140-ish current breweries, or I think at license 200. Brewport is seven and a half years old. Our license number was 34. That's how many breweries came after Brewport. When I was brewing at Bar in New Haven, we were license four. That opened in 1996, I believe, with license four. So we're at a point now of saturation, and the problem now is you don't know if it's a good beer or not because people will buy anything that says craft beer. They'll buy anything that, that is considered artisanal. We need to not let the marketing sell us and let our own personal palate sell us. Go to a place that gives you samples. Make sure that you understand what you have. Just make sure. I'm a big fan of drink local, think global, you know, everything. I don't like going to, I'll, I will go to a locally owned gas station and pay extra money than go to, you know, the pilot off the, off the highway or something. Now, we all know it's all of the oil is corporate anyways, but at least give your money. Don't go to TGI Fridays. Go to, what is this place, Wally uh, uh, Alley over here? You know, that's not a chain, I don't think. Go to a place that's local. You know, and, and I don't care if you drink my beer or you don't drink my beer. What I care about is I have 80 employees. New England Brewing Company, Rob Leonard is a very good friend of mine. He was so destitute about 12 or 14 years ago that he called me up once and he's like, hey Jeff, uh, you know, uh, I, need to, I need a little help. We, we need to brew a batch of Gandhi bot and I don't have all the grain. Can you help me out? Now I'm brewing at Bar New Haven. I'm not the owner, but I control the inventory. I'm like, yeah, I could help you out. What do you need? And he goes, all of it. <laughs> I'm like, all right, I said, make sure you bring it back. So 
He brewed the batch of beer. He got the batch out. He got the checks from the batch. That beer changed his life. Gandhi Ba and Sihag changed his life. They are the most um, uh, celebrated brewery in the state of Connecticut and one of the fastest growing breweries in the United States. And it is literally owned by him and his father and a handful of people. And that is important. To me, it's important. Why should we drink? Budweiser's not even an American company. It's a Belgian concern. It's hysterical. The number one selling beer in the United States right now, does anybody know what it is? Modelo. Yeah. Isn't that wonderful? Do you know where Guinness is brewed for the United States? Canada. It's brewed in Canada. Right? I went to the Bass Brewery in Burton-on-Trent, England. In Burton-on-Trent, the birthplace of soft English pale ales. And the Bass Brewery, at the top of their tower, is a giant Coors banner. And at the time, I was like, how awful is this? And I went to the, uh, the old Cooper Inn, which is where the brewmasters used to hang out for the Bass Brewery. And I told him I was a brewer from Connecticut, and I talked my way into being able to sit at the higher seat because those were people of stature. They had actually a, literally a step-up spot with a barrel that brewers and the owners of Bass used to sit. And they let me sit up there. And I told him, I said, this is awful. You know, how horrible is it? You walk around your town, and it says Coors. And they said, hold up. We all still have jobs. And I'm like, all right. So there is two sides to that coin. None of them drank that beer anymore. They drank Everard's, but they worked at the factory. That was a lot of fun. So the high tide, what do you think of the high tide? So we got one more beer, and then we'll do a little bit of Q&A. As you could tell, I kind of, I'm not going on notes. I'm just thinking of shit as we're going. Some of it's true. Uh, hopefully you guys are liking what I'm talking about. Am I holding the mic in the right spot? Because I was told I had to hold it really close to my chin. Good. Uh, so there's really only a little bit more that I want to talk about. We're in a modern age where every single thing that's in front of you is most likely a lie. I'm not. You know, my hair is naturally curly and I don't dye it. And I am actually 60 years old. Uh, beer is a great preservative, by the way. What you got to do is look at this. I have liver function study tests twice a year because I'm a hemophiliac and my liver is doing great. And my doctors always say, you know, you shouldn't really be drinking. I'm like, I'm a brewer. When the, you know, everybody's got to ask that question. How many drinks do you have a week? I'm like, what time of the day are we talking about? Because, you know, I got to sample stuff. But I tell them all the time that, you know, I was an athlete when I was younger. I took 25 years off. And then I got back into swimming, into exercising. And I exercised my liver like a Olympic athlete. And so far, so good. My wife hates that joke because she's 14 years younger than me. And uh, she, uh, she made a bad decision. She decided she fell in love with me and wanted to be with me. And uh, now she's petrified I'm going to die before her. I'm like, even if I was your age, I was likely going to die before you. So it kind of doesn't really matter. So the last beer we have is Dr. Porter's Stout. And I love this story. I said before that Benjamin Franklin said that every person has something in common, the ale in front of them. You guys now have five ales in front of you. We have a lot in common now. This particular beer is named after a real person. Dr. Porter, and you could look him up, maybe there's a book in this library about him. Dr. Porter is a very interesting man. He did the autopsy on John Wilkes Booth and on Abraham Lincoln while he was a, uh, a soldier in the army. When he got out of the army, he walked the Lewis and Clark Trail. Now think about the timing here. We're talking about the, the late 1860s, early 1870s. White people weren't really well liked in Indian Territory. When Lewis and Clark walked through there, they had no idea what we were offering them. You know, we're offering them, you know, all kinds of diseases and, you know, basically, I love this whole idea of uh, border walls and, you know, we got to keep them out. You know, if the Indians had that idea, I don't know, we might not all be standing here right now. But Dr. Porter walked the Lewis and Clark Trail and the reason that he didn't get scalped is it became quickly known that a white medicine man was going to be walking through the area and that he would help you. And he treated thousands of Indians and walked from, I don't know where he started, probably St. Louis, but walked from St. Louis all the way to the Pacific Ocean 
and treated Indians along the way. When he was done, he came home to Bridgeport. And in Bridgeport, he started experiments. And way before Mary Shelley wrote her book, he did experiments on corpses. So if you were hung in McGreevy Square, the same place that Lincoln came and spoke before he got elected, and that's where they hung everybody, and McGreevy Square still exists, right, in Bridgeport. If you were hung in McGreevy Square, Dr. Porter would be given that body. He would rush it back to his lab, and he would pay all the rich muckety-mucks, all of the, the, the guys like P.T. Barnum and all of his ilk would all pay to come and watch his reanimation experiments. And all he was doing was connecting them to large amounts of electricity, and their eyes would open and close, and their hands would open and close and twitch and, and move. I mean, it sounds pretty gruesome now, but it was, you know, he was learning about the American body and learning about our nervous system, and in the meantime, was given a bunch of rich folk, you know, a lot to talk about, and, and they were basically paying him his endowment. So Dr. Porter Stout is named after Dr. Porter. Now, the reason it's called Dr. Porter Stout and just not Dr. Porter's Porter is uh, a little game I play with people because I think it confuses them and it makes me happy. Uh, so if you can follow this, all stouts are porters, but not all porters are stouts. All right? All IPAs started as pale ales, but not all pale, pale ales are IPAs. So porters were the first of the dark beer. And stout porters were a derivative off of them. So a porter, and it got its name literally from the guys that would meet you at the ships in London and offer to take your baggage or move cargo from the ships to wherever it needed to go. They were the porters. And back then, when grains were kilned, they were dried, they were, they were kilned in open roasters. They weren't floor kilns like they are now. They were done in open roasters. And if the kiln uh, person had a little bit too much of his own product or the fire was too warm or whatever, some of those grains would get kilned a little darker. Those were sold cheaper because everybody wanted pale ale. We discovered glass in the early 1700s, and we realized this stuff looks like shit. We need it to look a little clearer and a little nicer, and they learned how to find the beer and make it look bright and nice in the glass. By the way, we totally screwed that up in the last 10 years with all these New England IPAs. I have no idea. If I sold a beer in 1995 that looked like a New England IPA, I would have sold a single beer and been ran out of the beer business. Now, if it's clear, people don't want to buy it. So porters were made with the secondary market grain and sold to the people cheaper. Therefore, the people who had less money, like the porters and the day workers and the maids and all of these things, they drank the porters. Now, my favorite thing about porters is they go so well. Porters and stouts go so well with oysters. Has anybody had a, a Guinness and a plate of oysters? Amazing. It's a, it, that's rich folk food now. We're like, oh, man, this is great. Well, porters and stouts were poor people drinks. Oysters and clams and lobster were free food at the beach. Rich people didn't eat those. In 1905, at the big prison in Portland, uh, New Hampshire, if you've ever taken the cruise out of, out of Portsmouth, I'm sorry, out of Portsmouth, there's still the facilities there. In 1905, there was the great prison uprising, and the prisoners rose up against the guards because they were complaining about eating lobster too many times a week. <laughs> the cockroaches of the sea. Porters were cheap booze for poor people, and lobsters were cheap food for poor people. Brewing was done by women until men found a way to make money on it. The whole legend of witches, if you think about it for a second, oh, a, beers were brewed by the spinster of the town. She was outcast to the corner of the village, being given the gift of being able to stay in a single shack because they couldn't own property. Women couldn't own property. Her husband could have been a landowner, but if she died with no, no offspring, that property was taken by the local lord, and she was designated to the end of the village. The only way she could make money, well, there was two ways she could make money. One of them, was brewing beer. When that beer was ready, she would take her broom out 
and hang it over her doorway. So the local drinkers would, would know that her ale was ready and the husbands would all flock to her place and they'd all start drinking. We all know what happens when a bunch of guys get together and they're drinking and there's one single woman. So she got quite the bad reputation. And when the women wanted to start talking to each other about you know, what's going on at the end of the village, they start telling stories and making up lies and saying, well, she must be a witch because my husband wouldn't do that. You know, she, she put a spell on him. So the whole, the whole legend of witchcraft comes from Brewsters, female brewers. And when in about 1650, 1680, we decided, we figured out men that we could make large quantities of it and make money on it, we outlawed women from brewing beer. Isn't that funny? Not sure how that works. But to get back to Dr. Porter's stout, it is a stout porter in that glass. So I wanted to use that double entendre to tell this great story about Dr. Porter. And as you can tell by all of the things that I've talked about tonight, I love history. I love the history of beer. I truly believe that every sip of beer has a story in it. Hopefully some of the stories I told tonight, you will tell other people. The greatest gift you can give to a storyteller is to tell his story to someone else and let it live on and live on and live on. So with that, I'm gonna say thank you very much. Hopefully you enjoyed the beer. And I'm more than willing to answer some questions. You gotta walk over to this lovely microphone over here. I'm gonna take another sip of my beer. Thank you. Um, I've, I've been to the Brewport, of course. A lot of us have. I noticed on your menu and so forth, the same beers are given on, on, on tap and in cans. Could you explain you know, the difference and so forth? Sure. One of the things, it's actually, that's a very good question. Uh, so we are all, uh, I'm going to guess, over 30. So you've all heard the story that Beer in can isn't, cans isn't as good as beer in bottles. You know, you get that can taste. Oh, don't drink it out of the can. Well, that was true in 1935 because it was a tin can that was spray-lined with a type of acrylic that would eventually break down because alcohol is a solvent. And when you pierced the can with your can opener, you opened up that tin and created the chemical reaction that would have happened as you're sipping that. And it tasted tinny. Nowadays... The can is by far the best package for this product. No sunlight and no oxygen. There is no such thing as a hermetically sealed bottle cap. Impossible. No matter how advanced they are. As a matter of fact, a lot of good breweries use oxygen barrier caps because they know there's going to be a certain amount of oxygen that's going to either leak in or already be in the bottle from the bottling process. And that cap is designed to eat the oxygen because oxygen is the kryptonite of beer. It makes beer taste wet and cardboardy. And obviously the, the, the metal reaction when it goes past the opening of an old tin can would have changed it. So the question actually was, why do we have the same beer in cans that we have on draft? Um, that is one reason and one reason only. Because I want you to take it home. Please. I want you to take it home so badly that we give you $10 off a case. So come to Brewport and you almost get the fourth six pack for free. And when we run out of draft beer, sometimes we have a little bit of the cans left, and once in a while, you know, if you ordered the Whaley Lager beer and you thought it was going to be on draft, it might, the server might tell you, well, we only have it in cans today because the next batch isn't ready, but we still had some cans left over from before. But the whole idea is that um, I have the, the ability to buy a canning line. Brew pubs don't have canning lines. I have so many toys. I'm so lucky that the Barretts actually believe the bullshit that I threw around. And... I was able to buy a canning line. My son worked at Two Roads for a while, knew how to run the canning line. So I'm like, that's, that's canned beer. So the way I sold it, you, you guys might like this. We brew 15 barrels of beer. So 15 barrels of beer is 30 kegs. So we make 30 kegs every batch of beer. Everybody wants something new. They always want something new. They race in when we have a new batch of high tide on tap, or now we have the King's Tide, which is a double IPA, which I didn't bring you guys to sample. So the King Tide's on tap. Oh, man, we all want to try it. But new fades. 
and they want to see what the next new thing and what the next new thing is. So I told my partners that what we're going to do is we're going to sell the last third of that 15 barrels first. Think about what I just said. We're going to sell the last third of it first. And I go, what? And I'm like, we're going we're to can five barrels of it, 55 cases, right off the bat. And we're going to put it in the store. So when you come and love the new batch of Blood Orange and you want to go home because you're not stupid and you're not going to drink six beers, but you could take six beers at home and drink them. You're not going to do anything but fart next to your dog, so it won't matter. So we're selling the last third of every batch with the first third of every batch. And now the last third of the batch is the middle third, if you, if you get my math. So that's how I sold it. And they went, all right. And it worked for me. So that's why we have both the cans and the draft beer. Other questions? Yes, thank you very much, Jeff. Your, your presentation is very entertaining and very informative. And leads me to my question. I have the, um, the worst illness for a beer drinker. Uh-oh. Gluten intolerance. Very aware. Yeah. Um, so there's an amazing thing out there now. Uh, it's called gluten-free beer, and it, some of it doesn't suck. <laughs> so... Omission? Uh, omission. That's... Omission's way down the end now, comparatively to the other stuff that's out there. Dura so there's a lot of levels of gluten intolerance. If you truly have Crohn's and you can't touch gluten, what I'm about to say probably isn't for you, but you should, first of all, talk to your doctor. But what we found is, is there's a, a fining agent. So a fining agent is something you put in beer that causes the proteins to flocculate out. Gluten's a protein. So one of these fining agents is so good at what it does that it actually causes gluten to flocculate out. So what you need to look for is beers called gluten-reduced beer because they can't call it gluten-free. But there's a lot of very good gluten-reduced beer. And one of the ones that refuses to put it on their label that's actually a very good beer is Little Heaven from Two Roads. Mm. They use that fining in their session IPA. And if you, I don't know what you tasted here or if you tasted anything, but th there is a difference. But it's not that big of a difference. Winston Churchill um, actually coined one of my favorite phrases of all time. He said, this is during uh, the beginnings of World War II, and he said, the man who coined the term near beer was a poor judge of distance. <laughs> and I loved that sentence. But I have my whole life been wanting to brew a beer that was uh, either excessively low in alcohol or, or no alcohol. And we have a brewery right in Connecticut, which is the cutting edge worldwide athletic brewing. And athletic, I, there's probably a dozen guys that work at that brewery that used to work with me or for me. And they are brewing um, what is considered non-alcoholic beer. And they're doing it not a lot differently than they were doing during Prohibition. But what they have down now is there's a genetically modified yeast that will only ferment up to 0.05% alcohol, which is considered legally non-alcoholic. And what Athletic is doing is they are producing this non-alcoholic beer, and they are the fastest growing brewing in the United States. They've also been rated one of the top 25 uh, businesses in the United States to work for. They're an amazing company. They do great things. And Athletic actually brews a non-alcoholic beer that even Winston Churchill might say, eh, if I had to. Uh, I have it in my refrigerator for my father-in-law who has AFib. He will drink a beer or two, but when he wants to do exactly what we're doing now and hang out with the guys and the ladies, everybody wants to be part of something, he drinks the Athletic. Now, the gluten-free beers out there, and I know most of the mid-range breweries have gluten-reduced beers, so I would do some research online and make sure that it is what you, what you want. I only know shit from Two Roads because I've been around them forever and a lot of the guys that work for me work for them and, you know, Brad Hiddle and I, you know, hit it off a while ago. He's got way more money than me. He takes a plane to lunch and, you know, I sit in my car and eat bologna, but, you know, we still have a beer in front of us that keeps us, you know, having the same thing in common. Uh, but I would look into that. There is some really good gluten-free beers out there. Yeah, Jeff, very good uh, presentation. Uh, I've been there since the first time I went there with the wise men, back many times for business one-on-one -on -one meetings and so forth. And sometimes we want to do it without beer, and we order the cider. 
mm -hmm. and you have a wide variety of very tasty ciders. Now, I suspect there's alcohol in the cider. So if, if you drink a couple of them, you can almost feel it. But what is the, uh, is there alcohol in the cider? And, and what's the cider program at your brewery? Um, hold on one second here. You want me to keep drinking alone, so I got to... <laughs> So I have a lot of funny things to talk about with cider, but uh, so the very first thing I ever fermented was cider, and uh, I had zero understanding of fermentation. I had zero understanding of anything other than the fact that I was told that if you take fresh cider, and I got it from Treats Farm, and put it in bottles with raisins, uh, that they would, it would turn to alcohol in 14 days, and then you could drink it. So do you guys remember Grosch, the big green bottles? I had a bunch of Grosch bottles, and I filled them with cider, and I put a bunch of raisins in them, and I capped them. <laughs> and I put them in my closet, because that's where everything went, my giant pile of laundry. And, and I let them set for 14 days. And a very good friend of mine, Bill Talty, he was actually at the uh, gourmet pizza dinner we had last night. Uh, we skipped a class. I went to foreign high school, and back then you could just walk out of school. We didn't have guards and metal detectors. And we ran to my house to grab some of my cider. And we couldn't get the bottle open, and we couldn't get the bottle open, and we couldn't get the bottle open, and we finally pried the bottle opener open, and the porcelain top flew off, dented my ceiling, spewed cider all over the ceiling of my bedroom, all over my beer cans, left about three ounces in the bottom that was so carbonated it was like champagne. It was horrible. And we drank it all. <laughs> so cider, hard cider has alcohol. Uh, most hard ciders you have to be careful of because you don't really taste uh, the alcohol the same way you do with higher alcohol beers. So you should always either read our menu or ask the bartender. If it's on our bar list, it's an alcoholic cider. And up until about... They changed the laws less than 10 years ago. Most of what you thought you were drinking as cider was malt beverage. Um, I had the luxury a long time ago to work with a guy named Dr. Joe Oates. He's the guy who discovered the enzyme that broke down complex carbohydrates that made light beer. He was a genius. And he brewed the very first light beer, and he brewed it for Rheingold. It was called Gablinger's. Anybody remember Gablinger's Light in the 60s? Uh, it was a horrible seller, and he got fired. When he got fired, Nobody would hire him. He ended up brewing at Moretti in Italy for several years. Didn't like staying in Italy. Came back, and Anheuser-Busch hired him to be the master brewer for all of their breweries worldwide because he was a genius and he spoke German. Gablinger's Light didn't sell. Rheingold sold that recipe to Miller in the 60s. Miller didn't touch it, didn't change it, made Miller Light. It is, to this day, still the best-selling light beer. And Dr. Joe Awades is the godfather, the grandfather of craft brewing. When Jim Cook decided he wanted to open up a brewery, and he tells people all the time, I grabbed my great-grandfather's recipe, everybody just assumes his great-grandfather was Sam Adams. No. His great-grandfather owned the Koch Brewery, K-O-C-H. He says Cook. The Koch brothers call it Coke. It's all spelt the same way. <laughs> the Koch Brewery in Pennsylvania was his great-grandfather's brewery. He had one recipe that wasn't very good. Jim was a genius marketing guy, and he hired Dr. Joe Oates to do all of his recipes, and Dr. Oates created craft beer after he retired from Anheuser-Busch. And every brewery you can name from 1985 to about 2000 that did anything, Dr. Oates had something to do with it. So that's a little sidebar to your question. But so ciders are wonderful, and they're gluten-free usually, so people who don't want to to even deal with gluten-reduced beers can drink ciders. But if it's at a bar, it's alcoholic. You know, my root beer, the Wellington's root beer, is non-alcoholic. And in the, the 2000s, there was a whole ton of, you know, not your father's root beer and everything. Um, I don't believe that you should make things like that. If you're going to make a soda, make it a soda. If you're going to make an alcoholic product, make sure people know what it is. Uh, yeah, hi. So you were talking about all the, um, in like the Dark Ages and the Renaissance, all the working people drank beer. Mm -hmm. Where does mead figure into this? And 
Um, is beer different than mead? Are they the same? What's the difference? Uh, very good question. So uh, probably next to this event, which by the way is amazing to be asked to come here and speak, one of my favorite places I ever spoke was um, in the Great Hall of Dinosaurs at the Peabody Museum. And um, I went there as a child and was absolutely petrified by the giant dinosaurs. And I was asked to run a, uh, a lecture on the history of fermented beverages. So I got the owner of Caseus, who is now the owner of um, uh, Black Hawk Brewing. He also owns Haven Hot Chicken and a million other things. He's like the hardest working man in Connecticut. Uh, he is a cheesemonger. And as I mentioned before, cheese is almost as ancient as beer. And it's a, really a fermented product. So cheese beer, and mead were the three things we talked about. I mentioned early on about a buddy, Buzzy. Uh, Buzzy got his nickname from what you exactly think he got his nickname from <laughs> when uh, he was in high school. But Buzzy ended up being a beekeeper. And so Buzzy was my mead expert. So yes, mead was being fermented uh, during the Middle Ages. It's not quite as old as, uh, as beer is, mainly because it's, uh, it's harder to get. You know, there's not that much honey. There's grain is everywhere. Uh, so they did, I mean, the friars fermented mead just the same way that they fermented, you know, malted barley. Uh, mead usually is much higher in alcohol, and uh, it'll definitely, you know, Friar Tuck, you know, probably had a tankard of mead in there because he was always uh, a little bit, uh, little bit tipsy. But mead came about uh, because the kings of the different regions of Europe wanted to control what was being fermented. Everybody knows the Rhein-Heisenbolt, the, the German purity law, and oh my God, they're so you know, strict and rigid and make sure their beer only has these ingredients, which by the way, started with three ingredients because they didn't know what yeast was, so they didn't know that much. But the Rhein-Heisenbolt didn't have anything to do with purity. It had to do with taxation. So you couldn't put honey in a beer in Germany because somebody could go find a beehive and throw it in their beer and make an alcoholic beverage that didn't get taxed. You couldn't put beets in it even though you could make, you could make alcoholic beverages out of beets or potatoes or you know, anything that's starchy. If you, if you try hard enough, you can convert those starch to sugars and turn those into alcohol. So the German purity law had everything to do with making money more for the kings and not about making something special. So mead was, again, it was almost like a, like a black market product that you could make that if you had local bees and you were able to, to handle it. The interesting thing about honey is it is so dense in its sugars that it doesn't spoil. So it has to be watered down just to be fermented. And it doesn't have any nutrients in it. So you really had to learn how to get some type of spontaneous fermentation. So it had to be mixed with stuff. There was something called sizer, which I actually made for a wedding, which is, is a barley mead mixture that comes from the Middle Ages. And uh, it is a, 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 almost a citrus uh, lemonade quality, if you do it right. Uh, but it's, it's tied into all of this. But um, mead was never, there wasn't just enough honey to make it mass produced. They probably let the witches do it on the corner because <laughs> they couldn't control it that way. Did that answer your question? Okay, sort of. Thank you. So right. it's still a fermented product. It's a absolutely fermented it's product made, made, made from, from honey. made from honey yes. instead of grain. Yes. Okay. So, I mean, the things that most people ferment, any type of grain, so barley, wheat, oats, but uh, wheat doesn't have many enzymes in it. Oats doesn't have any enzymes in it. Uh, so you have to have a certain amount of barley. If anybody is a fan of, of, of the brown liquids, you know, everybody talks about, you know, it has to be 51% corn. Well, the reason it has to be 49% barley is because the corn doesn't ferment on its own. There's, there's no enzymes. So you need the enzymes from the grain to break down those complex carbohydrates into sugars so that you can make that. So mead was similar in the fact that they had to do something more to it with the honey to make it alcoholic. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, when you feel like having pizza or beer, please think of Brewport. 
I didn't even mention, oh, it's off already. Uh, I did bring some root beer, and any of the products up here or anything left over, feel free. It's up to you to, to dole out. But